Okay, and we are live. I'm here with Mitch Brisker, who has been making waves around the world right now because he's featured in a fantastic article in the Daily Mail. He's been on this channel before. The Daily Mail tried to claim it was a complete exclusive, but he's already spoken to me and I think Aaron and others in this sort of community as well. And it's been a pleasure to talk to him. We're going to be talking about Tom Cruise and how he became this abusive kind of person from where he started from. Uh, Mitch, why don't you give us a little rundown about your, your channel at the moment and what we're going to be talking about today? Well, essentially, the name of my channel is Scientology, The Big Lie. Uh, it's the title of a book that I have coming out actually next week on Amazon. Oh. And uh, hopefully I'll be publishing it in the UK and Australia as well so we can cover the English-speaking world. Uh, it's essentially why I came onto YouTube was to promote a book and YouTube's a funny thing. You know, once you show your face, people want to hear about all kinds of different things. So I'm sure you can understand. Yeah. So it's Scientology, the big lie. Uh, there's dashes in between each of those words, or you can just look up Scientology, the big lie, you know, at Scientology, the big lie, you'll find it. Search my name, Mitch Brisker on YouTube. You'll find it. It's, I've kind of become very present. Okay, let's do this. Yes, let's do this. Well, I should just say it's not, you don't have to search it, people, because the link to the channel, to Mitch's channel, is right below. So you can click on that and go and subscribe and hit hit enable notifications so you know whenever he posts uh, and help Mitch out with this. Like you help all of us because these people give uh, all of their time and have some amazing experiences to talk about. And I'm also, I'm going to ask you afterwards and get the link for the book and put that beneath as well because we should have that. So we're going to get into Tom Cruise, right? You were about as close and personal as anybody who's left Scientology so far has been to both Tom Cruise and David Miscavige, I think, in terms of just being there. What, what was it that, you, that I think you want to get to the heart of today with regards to Tom Cruise? Well, yeah, when I consider Tom Cruise in 1990, when I first met him, when he first came up to the international base, we were living in like adjacent cottages uh, that were, you know, provided for VIPs or whatever. I was up there hired as a pro uh, filmmaker. I didn't really consider how long I was going to be there. I thought it was just for one project. And then Tom came up and, you know, see, you know, it's just observing him and then thinking about how he got into Scientology as a vulnerable, young, rising you know, uh, up and coming actor uh, who had then, you know, had this friendship engineered by David Miscavige, who sort of, once he found out uh, that this guy ha was in Scientology, he kind of killed off everybody around him. He kind of disintegrated his social structure, you know, got, got you know, got, got engineered his, uh, his divorce with Mimi Rogers and, you know, engineered his marriage with Nicole Kidman before he then later destroyed that one. But I saw this sort of blooming friendship, which was Tom becoming in, in falling into Dave's bubble and into sort of his clutches, if you know what I mean. I mean, because I used to see those two guys ride around the base on their little dirt bikes, which is how people got around there because it's a large property. And it was all sort of fun and they were like boys and it was like they'd been separated since they were children and there was a big happy reunion. I mean, they played it like that, but you know, be, behind the scenes, Miscavige had very deliberately engineered it, Tom into his sphere. And uh, then, you know, you move forward and you, when you consider, uh, you know, then the divorce with Nicole Kidman and then there was uh, the, the relationship with, uh, Penelope Cruz, which fell apart, you know, because of her commitments to another religion. And yeah. as much as Scientology says they accept that, they're intolerant. And then you have Girlfriend Gate, you know, with uh, when they were looking for Nazanin. a girlfriend for with Yeah, Nazanin Bonadari. And, and then you have, obviously, the, the Katie Mitchell fiasco. And so all of these, these things, they, they sort of led Tom, I believe, to become the abused who was then fine, ultimately becoming an abuser, becoming more and more like Miscavige. I, and I think they mirror each other. They sort of become sort of like one another. You know, like I didn't see when I first met Miscavige, he wasn't obsessed with wealth and celebrity. Uh, he didn't see himself as a mega celebrity the way he does now. And I, I just see that fascinating to see a person make that kind of arc. I think um, 
So David Miscavige must have been quite ambitious at the beginning, just even just to take the power once L1 Hubbard died. And my understanding was that a vacuum sort of opened up and then Miscavige grabbed it with two hands. And so he must have been quite ambitious from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I first met him, I thought he was, he engineered my arrival at the base, kind of behind the scenes. That's a whole long story. That had to do with their inability to get films done. And I was in LA working with a marketing group uh, on a Dianogs book, and we had sold like 10 million books. And that was like, in such contrast to the failures they were having, that he sort of brought that whole thing, that whole endeavor up to the international base where it just languished and was never successful again. But it's not so much that I don't think so much of vacuum. I'm not the best person to talk about that. But from my observation, it's not so much of a vacuum because Hubbard had put in place, like there was never going to be a Hubbard 2.0. You know, there was never going to be the next sort of spiritual leader. So he set up a this mechanism whereby there would be layers and layers and, and, and individuals and checks and balances so he didn't so much fill a vacuum as he dismantled a structure that had been put in place. He very carefully took it all apart, which left him in the position where the, nobody else, the lawyers weren't going to listen to anybody else. He was the guy. Like, you could try to take him down, it wouldn't matter, because he had the purse strings uh, and he had this supposed connection to Hubbard. I see. What, but, you when know. you talk, talk about the, the two of them going around on bikes, Miscavige and Cruz, yeah. what's the rest of the base thinking? Are people looking up and are they overawed by celebrity or are they scared David Miscavige is going to come and punch them in the face if they don't show that they're working hard enough? Uh, they're over, the, the celebrity thing is, it, it, celebrities are like tools to a Sea Org member in the Sea Org. A, a, cele, a celebrity is like the only function they serve is to get help get the message out. They don't look at a celebrity and think, you know, there's a shining example of a Scientologist. They're, they're like, no, there is a person that is going to bring uh, attention to our group that we can exploit. It's a, it's a everything in Scientology is transactional. The reason it's bad for children with, with non, you know, with regular, uh, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill Scientologists who have kids. It's not good for the kids because the relationship between the parents and the kids tends to be transactional. You know, you get your statistics up, you can have your allowance and some, you know, whatever. Kid, nobody in Scientology is just loved because they're there um, for who they are. It all has to do with sort of what you're doing for the group and so forth. So people were like, oh, that's cool. Look, there's, you know, there's COB, as he insisted on being called, and Tom. And they're racing around and people are kind of waving and getting out of their way. And it was kind of a, a joyful thing, which is why I, I, from that, I never predicted that it would just get so dark and so ugly. Wow. So... Do you remember then the first time you, or the first times you encountered Tom Cruise and were working with him and talking with him? Well, I never really, were, I, well, that's not true I, that I didn't work with him, but I, the first time I ever interacted with him, um, it's funny, the first memory I have of Tom is he and Dave on their, their little dirt bikes racing around, and there was one time where I, this one time for some reason I remember it was, uh, they were racing along and Tom was just, you know, he was a wheel ahead, right? And for some reason, Miss Gavish looked back at me and he thought that I was calling him over, right? And so he stopped in the middle of the race and he came over and he said, what's going on? And very nicely, right? I mean, this guy wasn't, you know, nobody's just one thing, right? But you, sure. you do get judged at the extremes. So you tend to be judged at the extremes, so... Uh, if you're extremely nice or extremely horrifically violent, people are going to be more concerned about your violence. He came back to me very nice. He said, hey, yeah, what's going on? And I said, nothing. I, I well, what? And he says, oh, I thought you called me over. And then he looked at Tom flying off into the distance. And he was like, oh, man. And then he just gave me a funny little smile and he drove off. Like, it was okay, right? Like, things were kind of jovial and fun and it was like, you know, Tom's here, and oh, look, he's just laying in a helicopter. He's here for the week. You know, he would arrive, uh, there's a big meadow out there, and he would land a, his helicopter in the meadow. And that was, you know, that was kind of like you always knew when Tom was there, because it's like, it's kind of hard to miss, uh, uh, you know, a helicopter. Uh, but so, yeah, I, I had like, 
I had interactions with him. I would see him because we were neighbors coming and going. Um, when he was with, uh, what's her name, Paula Wagner, his producing partner, his previous, I took them on a tour. You know, I was asked, to, he wanted, he brought Paula up um, and I took them on a tour. And, you know, I was invited uh, to spend four days on the set of War of the Worlds uh, as kind of a, yeah, it was cool, but it wasn't sort of, you know, I think Tom was aware of my work and, and because the films, there was a lot of very embarrassing films, uh, visual things in Scientology. Probably the two most uh, stand out were the films, the training films, which were extremely important to Scientology, but they were horrific, which is why I was brought up to the base to start remake those films and, and make the ones that had never been made. And I think when the films, I think Tom was really grateful that all that the films became super high quality because he's a filmmaker and they were a reflection of him, even though they're very internal. And then there's, you know, the buildings, a lot of the churches were in these just horrifically sketchy neighborhoods and they were, they were like a walk up, you know, over a bait shop or just some mm. stupid, thing and and you know this is one of the motivations for building all these incredible churches was tom so you know it, just as an aside a lot of people conjecture if tom doesn't have power like he's maybe he's the number two guy or if, if miscavige got hit by a bus tom would take over you know nothing could be farther from the church but what he has is influence miscavige has all of the control over tom because he's 100 percent controlled but then Tom has a lot of influence over Dave because of who he is, like that he would inspire this this movement to build these what they call ideal orgs. You know, one of the first ones being in Spain. You know, when he was dating Penelope Cruz, all of a sudden we get this, you know, multi-million dollar spectacular building in Spain. So you know, that's kind of a yeah. bit of their relationship is power versus influence. I've got, uh, before we continue about Tom Cruise, uh, I'm not bringing you a sponsor as such. It's actually just myself, a bit of work. I, I told Mitch just before, though, he has nothing to do with it. So if anyone's angry about any of this stuff, it's nothing to do with Mitch, of course. But I actually have a new channel that is just being made called Heretics. And I'm just going to play a 45-second trailer now. I hope you can hear it. Welcome to Heretics, the channel where I mine wisdom from those who dared to defy. It's perfectly legitimate to say, I am a man, but I feel feminine, but to then say, therefore I am a woman, is just a betrayal of language. There's intense pressure on people to, to lie, and I won't do it. It's a movement that tries to destroy heretics. The process to get here is awful. The journey out is horrific. Why can't I be okay with being silent and subservient? Everyone else is. How do you feel if a person of a different race moved in next door? I spent a while with a politically correct faction of the Ku Klux Klan. The system punishes people for wrong think. It's heartbreaking. Now, it's your turn. Just start watching. And then, oh, I'm on the wrong thing here. Wait one second, I'm just gonna show you. There's the page. And you just hit subscribe over there. There's a link below in the description next to Mitch's channel as well. And you can do this on his as well. You go subscribed, and then you wanna go down to all so you get reminders for that stuff. That's my new channel. It's gonna be all uh, pre-recorded, really cool, controversial, interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks good. It's nice to see that you picked, a, you know, a nice calm subject matter to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm not. I don't have enough people angry at me, so I've got to. I've got to have even more angry. You know what it oh, was? It was that I, I think I it's great. That, I, I, oh, thank you. I just want to say yeah. I'm just gonna. I just want to say I support you 100. percent I get that it's real controversial and all that, but I, I, I'm really looking forward to your new channel. I think, it's a, I think it's great. I think you're the perfect person to be doing it. Quite honestly, I am green with envy. So there oh, you go. Thank you so much. Well, that means a lot you're coming welcome. from you with your camera directing prowess. <laughs> so thank you so much. And yeah, you know what it is, is that pe people got upset and offended if I ever mentioned those things. And those things are important to me to discuss sometimes. And I figured, you know what? People who are interested can go to the other channel and those who are going to be maybe offended or don't want to see that kind of stuff like in, that 
they'll stay here. And I think that's, it's good to separate them. So that's the idea. So yeah, mm. people, you know, when you're checking out Mitch's channel below and hitting subscribe and, and turning on that alarm reminder, do it for mine if you want to watch it. Because I've also realized you don't want subscribers who are just trying to help you out, but then won't watch your stuff because that, mm. that doesn't help. So you only really want people to come and subscribe and click that notification if they will watch it. But thank you for the kind words, Mitch. Um, Getting back to Tom Cruise and actually continuing to talk about your directing prowess, did you feel pressure knowing that this is a guy who's working with Spielberg and some of the biggest directors in the world and then he's coming back to film things with you? Well, no, I never actually filmed with him. He, he's mm. not involved. He was never involved in our filmmaking activities in any way whatsoever. But no, I didn't because, uh, you know, the work I was doing was never going to be held up against, uh, you know, Spielberg's work or whatever. And you know, I'm I'm not competing with anybody other than myself to you know try to do better and improve. And that was such a niche activity of making the technical training films, as they're called. Um, you know, I, I occasionally I I assumed Tom was saw a lot of the work I did, and sometimes I would know it explicitly because Miss Gabbard would say, "Oh, you know, I showed that to Tom, and he really liked it," which to me was a little clue as in terms of. Tom's influence, because there were, you know, he, Tom needed to like things for, for Dave to move forward with them. But it wasn't, again, it's influence, it's not control. Dave had the control. I mean, I truly believe that Tom is very siloed and knows a whole lot less than anybody thinks. I mean, look, and you might say, well, how is that possible? Because we hear so much about all the violence in Scientology, and we hear about the whole, and we hear about, you know, people being kicked and punched and slapped and Put in buckets of water, and all that's a hundred percent true. But that was going on sometimes thirty feet away from where I was, and I didn't know it. It's that easy to keep this stuff from people like everybody on that base, the, all the Sea Org members, the Gold Staff members. They all knew about it after the whole thing was done with, and they bulldozed it over. I asked somebody for directions of where something was, and they said, "Oh, you know." just go across the street and then buy where the hole used to be. It was just a reference point, right? Uh, so, uh, but I'm saying that to make the point of how easy it is to keep information from people. Of course, I found out about that in 2015 when I was asked to look at a bootleg copy of uh, Going Clear because, you know, they wanted, to, they wanted my involvement in terms of doing public relations to push against it, right? Which is actually a silly thing to do, but when I saw it, I was really like, I couldn't believe it. And I had helped to make a film, a video, a piece of uh, intense propaganda, whitewashing gold and talking about wh wh how wonderful it is and all these great humanitarian programs that they support with their media. And I was interviewed in this thing extensively. The video is on YouTube. It's called uh, something like The Sea Org Inside Gold Mirror Productions. And that video was produced within a hundred yards of the hole. So they're talking about supporting human rights groups and how much they care about people. Meanwhile, within a hundred yards of where the camera is, they've got like a hundred people locked up in a trailer. And so I took that video when I left and started speaking out. I, it's on my channel. I took that video and then I did a response video to it. You know, I put myself in a little box and whatever. And it's a really interesting. It, it gives a lot of insight. So, but my point is, if, if it was that easy to keep all that information from me, how, how and Tom's at a much greater distance from any of that stuff. Like, I don't think he, like, there's a chance he didn't know about Nazanin scrubbing a, a bathroom with a toothbrush. It wasn't his idea. They'd already broken up. Uh, and that's just how they ran her after the fact. And then, of course, he would then read about it at Vanity Fair and think, oh, you know, the, the enemies of the church are publishing bad stuff. That never happened. Like, he probably didn't even know. And that's not to say he's not to be held accountable because that's going on around you. You need to know that stuff. But It's, it's, a, it's a really complicated one because there's that fine line between uh, – perpetrator and victim and I suppose in a sense everybody bar the head is both a perpetrator and a victim um, even people very high up even people like Tom Cruise he does seem by all accounts to be a true believer at the same yeah. time the idea that he doesn't know any of the abuses going on that he isn't aware that 
you, you know, just at a very basic level, um, Miscavige does go around just hitting people like he did to Mike Rinder, uh, or that people get thrown into the hole. He must know some of that. And I suppose to, to that extent, he's complicit in the abuses of Scientology to some extent. Yeah, well, yeah, you're 100% right. Uh, it, there's the effort to keep information from some someone and then there's the individual's own decision to not see it. And I know what that phenomena is because I not see a lot of things, which I later went, wait a minute. That, you know, if I would have just been in a different mindset, I could have seen that. So there, there's that sort of, it's almost like not the fog of war. Let's just call it, it's the fog of cult. It's the fog of cult belief that you just don't see something that's in front of your eyes. So, but I think he's aware far less than people assume. I think it's 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 nice to speculate that he's just this hundred percent bad person. Whatever you know, to to engage in that kind of speculation where you know he and he and Miscavige behind the curtain are like going, <laughs> you know, what, what are we? What kind of pain are we going to flick? But it's just not that. I mean. Here's a fundamental difference between these two guys. They're both very narcissistic and they tend to mirror one another. <clears throat> but I've seen Tom engage, you've heard the term uh, narcissistic uh, philanthropy, right? There's this type of narcissist that they're philanthropic. They might be a pillar of your community. They might be the head of the Red Cross, or some organization that feeds blind orphans or something, but they really do it in a very public way because the adulation they get from it helps to feed their identity because they don't have an identity. So they're, they're, that becomes their identity. And so Miscavige is 100% engages in philanthropic narcissism. He's not gonna you know, do anything for anybody unless there isn't a camera crew or an audience or yeah. unless it can be broad, broadcast broadly to reflect it on the greatness of Scientology. But I've seen Tom engage in, all, in acts of of philanthropy and stay hidden in the background and take no credit for it. You know, I remember when I went to visit them on War of the, essentially I went to visit the art department on War of the Worlds because I was interested in some of the advanced techniques they were using in special effects and on the set and so forth. So I basically mostly spent four days with Spielberg's art department taking pictures and talking to them. They're just really lovely, gracious people. But one of them was telling me they were shooting out of the, some rural area, maybe Virginia or something, and they stopped that up at a, what do you call it? I have to give my dog a treat. He, he, I've trained my dog, so when I'm sitting here, he knows if he comes up, he gets a treat, so he'll go away and not interrupt. So they're, they're driving in the, <laughs> he's like a drug addict now. They're driving <laughs> in, the, in the country, and they, they stop at a Dairy Queen, right? You know what a Dairy Queen is. You have, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, in the Dairy Queen, there, you know, there's some high school girls working behind the counter, and there's a basket on the counter, and it, it, they're soliciting uh, donations for one of their schoolmates who worked with them at the Dairy Queen. She'd had a horrible car accident and was having difficulty paying her bills. And, you know, Cruz went in there, got an ice cream, whatever. And, and anonymously, shortly thereafter, somebody from his, uh, his entourage came in there and dropped a check for $10,000 in the basket. And so, like, he never took, like, he's not saying, hey, go get the camera crew. I got a story here. I want, you know, he's just not like that. So I, I see, it's like, if he's just out of the clutches of Miscavige, he just always seems to be this really nice, gracious guy. <laughs> you hear what That's I, you interesting, know, isn't it? it? But, but you yeah, know, and you I'm what, like, I, 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 I'm just going to say there's two, there's two things I said because that firstly that philith what was it? narcissistic philith philanth philanthropy is a really interesting yeah. concept and I think it even goes as far as people like Jimmy Savile who was the horrible man doing that I don't want to use the words of what he was too much on YouTube but doing those horrible right. things in England and he he was like the, you know right involved in charities and things like that even more than than that I think because with him it was hiding in plain sight as well but I think there is that does speak to being human and we sometimes forget that people who join cults are humans like the rest of us and most mm -hmm. humans want to see them themselves as good people so it's very unlikely that tom cruise as you say walks around say you know laughing and saying i'm a horrible person i'm sure he thinks right. everything he does is wonderful and he does want to help out when he can with this and that it's just unfortunately the ideology seems to have captured him to such an extent uh, as what you seem to be saying that he's just made himself totally blind to the abuses that are going on 
Yeah, yeah, and I, th I think if that, you know, I kind of, I tend to refer to it as a reality distortion field, which is a term that originally came out of Star Trek, and then was applied to Steve, to Steve Jobs, his ability to get people to believe things just with sheer mental force and, you know, marketing and all these other things. And, you know, the uh, Hubbard was a master of this reality distortion field, as is Miscavige, but they both added violence to it, more so Miscavige, but in addition to all of the, the sort of mental force that's used to overcome another person, they both add violence, which is tragic. But I, my point is, I think if that reality distortion field ever shut down, Tom would, I mean, he'd be confused, but he'd probably call his daughter. <laughs> you know, if that thing just shut off. You know, I mean, I yeah. just, I've always kind of believed that. And, and, and I don't want people to think that, I don't think that he's, um, you know, culpable for his own, whatever. We all have to. I love, I never punch any, I was not an abusive person in Scientology because I was always generally very well treated, but I made these films. I mean, I made a film literally, and I didn't even realize it, a, a film for instructing auditors. These are only seen in, inside the church. Literally about a guy, it happened to be starring Jason Begay, so I had to leave, make the film over again after he left, but he played a guy who it turned out he, in the course of his his counseling session it comes out that he had drugged and raped his best friend's girlfriend sorry assaulted his best friend's girlfriend right like this is in this is a film that hubbard wrote to teach people how to counsel and this guy he so transforms that he's no longer in right in the counseling session he's laughing he's completely recovered and he says, I'm going to go find that girl and get her some counseling and make sure she's okay. And I'm going to find my friend and make sure they're okay. And it's all, it's all joyous and wonderful. But then, you know, when I got some distance from it, I went, oh, my God. Basically, they're saying, they're reinforcing this lie that Scientology has the power to completely rehabil rehabilitate a criminal and to make the victim whole, to, to, to handle their trauma. But because it doesn't work, when you get a, 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 such a massive failure like Danny Masterson, they have to cover it up. They have to protect him, and they. You, you, but it's literally baked into the training. Like it's 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 not. It's you know they're not trying to protect a criminal organization or criminality. They're trying to protect what they believe is the only hope for any of us to survive into far into the future. So. Hmm. Sorry, I went on a bit, a bit of a no, tangent, but not not at all. Well, so Tom Cruise, then it would make sense that he would believe in a lot of this stuff. Like basically, the my my understanding Absolutely. is the overriding idea is you have the power to control your own life, and that's what Scientology teaches. It's what a lot of cults teach, and sometimes mm -hmm. psychologists teach that it's not always a bad thing to learn. You can control your life to an extent as long as it's not taken too far. But when you're Tom Cruise and you've become the most famous superstar, richest, most glamorous, whatever guy in the world, it makes sense that you would believe, hey, you can do it too. Anyone can do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, yes, that's sad, but true. I mean, there's, you, you brought up an interesting point. Okay, so there's this thing in Scientology, which a lot of people have heard about because of the Danny Messerson trial, which is, what did you do to pull it in, right? Yeah. We've all kind of heard this, this idea that uh, a victim walks into the church and they've been abused and by a fellow Scientologists and they say, hey, I need help. I've been traumatized and they, and they get sat down and told, well, you must have done something either in this lifetime or another lifetime. Now you said, you know, some idea comes, may be even exist in, psych, in psychology, like you do, right? It's almost like a universal idea, like you can do it all yourself. That may exist in psychology, it may exist in cults, but here's the difference, okay? If you go through some, let's say, incredibly traumatic experience that really wasn't your fault, if you ask yourself at some point, do I need to do something different? Do, you know, why do I keep finding the same abusive partners? Why do I keep getting fired from my jobs? Asking yourself this, I think, can be empowering and be healing. Where the problem is, is when another person forces it on you and they say well what did you do it's you get what i'm saying it's a it's yeah. a very 
devious way of gaining power of their person. And then it makes it look like this idea of self-empowerment, of really being able to look and ask yourself what you did wrong, it kind of defeats that. Yeah, I think no, I think that's that's absolutely the difference, and that is the issue. But tell me, so here's another thing. Okay, we can say Tom Cruise might be a little bit different to the other, um, to to the perception of him being extremely abusive and and all of those things. Maybe that's true. But why is it that so many people speak so highly of John Travolta? compared to Tom Cruise so many people say oh gosh Tom Cruise really is not that good guy and John Travolta is well I mean because we have John's never divorced a wife and then estranged himself from his children right I mean that's he's um you've just never heard about John being abusive um uh uh I'm trying to uh, Plus, John is, uh, he's culturally really important as a pop icon, and Tom isn't, if you think about it. Tom is a very handsome guy who who's, can be, in the, with the right film uh, show, tremendous acting ability. But if Tom Cruise never made a movie, uh, if we went back in time and prevented all the Tom Cruise movies from being made, it wouldn't really have any impact on pop culture. But if you did the same with John, it would be really different. You wouldn't have Grease. You wouldn't have Saturday Night Fever. You wouldn't have Urban Cowboy. You wouldn't have films that affected the way people dressed and the music they listened to uh, and potentially even their relationships. So, you know, John is, he's culturally way more important than Tom. So it's easy to like him. And then you don't hear any of these stories. I mean, Tom is just, I'm sorry, John has just had these tragedies. He, when he got into Scientology, he had just suffered through the death of his love, Diana Hyland. Um, you know, he met an actress on the set of The Devil's Reign, a film nobody's even heard of, an actress by the name of Joan Prather. She gave him a Dianetics, she was Scientologist, she gave him a Dianetics book uh, and, you know, brought him into Celebrity Center and that's how he got started. And he used to be around there all the time. I was there when he came in, he, in the 80s, uh, we were in late 70s, rather. We were, in, uh, we were on uh, Celebrity Center. It was on 8th Street, right around the corner from the, uh, you know, Hollywood Boulevard, the Walk of Fame part of Hollywood Boulevard. And he was just around. He was just a guy. He I was on a TV show, but he hung out with people. He said hi to people. So he was just kind of, you know, Tom's never done that. Tom's always come through the back door, VIP, you know. Uh, but, you know but I mean, that was kind of engineered for him to do that. But it's a very different perception. And plus, if you look at, if you, you know, I mean, Tom did this one thing, remember in Tropic Thunder, where he mm. played, in Tropic Thunder, where he played the producer. It was kind of a Harvey Weinstein, uh, a cross between Harvey Weinstein and David Miscavige. He played this character. He was bald and he was fat and he was loud and mean. And people loved it. They love seeing him, I think, in that role more than they like seeing him in Top Gun. And so John does those kinds of character parts. I mean, he's put on a dress. He's been an awkward, you know, line dancing cowboy. You know, he's been a the guy in Greece and Saturday Night Fever. People love that. It's really endearing. Tom doesn't do that kind of work. So uh, that very much could be it. There have been some reports about John Travolta, just um, reports about, I think, more than one masseur who John did yeah. things around that was that was not wanted, but it just sort of got maybe because people like John so much that was brushed under the carpet a bit. Whereas if it was Tom Cruise, that might have been a much bigger story. So are there other examples then of of I mean I remember Karen de la Carrière told me a story about you know I think it was that Tom Cruise had he had the Scientology members work all night to to put flowers mm -hmm. out for Nicole Kidman and then I think he didn't like the flowers so they had to work the whole day to change the flowers and that's the kind of thing that people used to get annoyed with 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 regards to Tom Cruise and Scientology. Yeah, I remember when that happened. I was actually living at the base. I remember he was coming up for the weekend. And I, I was generally never there on weekends. I had a family in L.A. and I would go to see my wife and kids. And um, I remember seeing them, uh, you know, pulling out weeds and just, just a huge crowd of Sea Org members are doing the planning of this thing. And I was just driving away thinking like, wow, that's so. But I, I don't think it was Tom who didn't like the flowers. I think it was it was one of these outrageous love bombing things that Miscavige did for him. 
right? Like he sort of made that whole thing happen. I don't really, I think Tom came up and saw it, and, you know, was just like, wow, thanks. I don't think he was the one sitting there, you know, uh, you know, supervising it and saying, no, less daffodils, more roses or whatever. <laughs> I, that, that's Miscavige. He, he's the one who obsessively micromanages everything. So, yeah, uh, okay, I, yeah about, I don't, I, I'm, um, with, with regards to, I, I gather that he had a lot of Scientologists helping him move home and doing all these kinds of things. Yeah. He must be aware these guys are like not being paid. He must know that. And it's basically slave labor. Yeah. But it's like, I, I mean, I, I, you know, for 28 years, I like lived with these guys and yes, it was very awkward. I wanted to, I didn't want that job to last more than a couple of years. I felt really awkward because I'm being paid a hundred times. I don't know. I can't even calculate it. Uh, 50, uh, yeah, yeah, more than that. Uh, a week, right? And I'm living in a nice cottage, the next door to the one Tom Cruise is living in. Actually, the cottage I lived in, Miscavige, it was set up for him originally while his place was being rebuilt. So it was, you know, it was nice. Uh, um, I, I lost my train of thought. So, well, oh, I would yeah, just, yeah, I would yeah. just the, say the, the, money, the difference is. Yeah, of course he'd be aware of it, but but yeah, but I know this. I know this, Andrew, because I've experienced it myself. It's like, well, that's their decision. That's what they want to do. They want to live this life of austere service in in this group. That's what they want to do. They've chosen this. You're not thinking, well, they're getting fifty bucks. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I remember one of the staff members said, God, you're paid so much more than us. And I think, well, hold on. I got a family of four. I got to put some money aside for the future. I got to pay for health care. I got to pay for pension because the church doesn't do anything to support its professionals that it hires. It's like you're on your own. Um, but I said, you know, at the end of the week, yeah, I'm paid more than you, but you know, you get 50 bucks a week, but at the end of the week, you still got 10 bucks in your pocket and I'm broke. So this was kind of the way that I would. So we know about this, but it's like, hey, that dude, that's your choice. That's what you chose to do. I'm not, nobody's making you do that. You, you fall into that mindset. I suppose the difference plus, plus, bet, bet, between you and Tom Cruise in that respect, though, is that it, it, people aren't joining Scientology for you. They're joining, um, I, I imagine, a percentage of them for Tom Cruise, for his big face. And I suppose it's like those, yeah. those celebrities who endorsed cryptocurrency and people got into it and lost loads of money. I, I would think they should feel a little bit guilty. And with regards to Tom Cruise, yeah. I mean, Scientology is, is just as bad as any of those crypto things or worse. Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to have some work to do when the reality distortion machine finally falls apart and he no Will longer it? has that emotional... Sorry? Will it? Oh, oh, will it fall apart? Well, it's nothing mm -hmm. sustainable. I mean, uh, uh, it, it probably never completely, unless Miscavige really becomes so unhinged one day that he actually goes too far with his violence and kills somebody, which is, you know, and with somebody that violent, right? I mean, what's to prevent him from, you know, just you're in the wrong position. You're on the roof. You're on the top terrace. At the, at the building and flag where he hangs out and you have an argument with somebody and you give them a shove and they go over the railing. You know, I mean, it's like there's any, you know, it could happen when you when you get violent with people like that, there's always a potential that somebody's not gonna survive it, right? Um, so we're talking about, is it, it's not sustainable. I mean, look, you know, take the Mormons. They had, a, they had a much worse than Scientology does because they had shoot on sight they also had proportionately a lot of more money and a lot more power and they had a huge army and just like Scientology, they illegally trapped people from Europe. You know, Brigham Young drove them to, to Salt Lake City. David Miscavige is driving everybody, enticing them to come to Clearwater where he's hoping to create such a fortified base that you'll never be able to dig it out. So he's kind of, I'm sure I have many reasons to say that he's looked at the Mormon model, not the religion, but the history and the organization and said, that's what you do. You get so dug in somewhere that they can never get rid of you. And I think that's what he's trying to do in Clearwater. So no, it's not sustainable, but I, I you know, he's going to die eventually. We all are. So in that sense, I don't, you know, I don't know how the next iteration of the reality distortion field is going to arise 
that's interesting. Well, I, I mean, apart from us going to die, that's depressing. But it's an interesting thought to <laughs> yeah, see sorry. this will <laughs> go in the future. But some people are saying that my audio's gone a bit funny. Does it sound funny to you, Mitch? No, you're okay. Uh, maybe it's You're then it must okay. be something to do with the way it's being transmitted i don't know um so sorry about that people who are watching i hope you can understand still um and thank you for joining us for, you know for now and, and do hit that like button and everything um what was i going to ask just just now um oh yeah well this we okay were, so we talked about dave david miscavige's violence you know and how you, it's amazing you think it could go so far that he might kill someone so i mean to how far does it go? And I remember you telling me that you didn't witness it for a long time and then one day you suddenly did and you were like, whoa, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So um, was there a question in that? I'm sorry, Andrew. Just how, how bad is it? How regular? How, how, what's he doing? Well, give us an image. Is he, is he just throwing people on the floor? Well, I, I imagine uh, they can't fight back. Yeah, I mean, uh, essentially, I mean, uh, you know, f realize I haven't seen him since 2018. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I and I know that the kind of extreme violence that he engaged in when he had people in the hole and he was punching people and pushing people around and etc. Uh, I've, I've not seen or heard about that kind of violence outside of the international base because the international base was such a secure bubble, you know, with with all of the, the razor wire and the cameras and the guards that, you know, you felt really safe where. You know, uh, Miscavige is very aware of his image, and he's, I'm sure he's aware that his violent nature has a negative effect on his image. So he's, I'm sure he's keeping it in check uh, because, you know, he doesn't go to the international base anymore. He, in LA, he works out of Scientology Media Productions or Office Services. And obviously, when he's in Clearwater, he works out of the flag building. So, but he, he's, I, you know, when I was working with him at Scientology Media Productions, the verbal abuse was really intense. I think the, he was in check on the violence, but I mean, the verbal abuse, you know, the, the fat shaming and, and the, you know, the one particular woman who is uh, very loyal to him and uh, high up in the Commodore's Message Organization who had pulled off some amazing projects and was a really smart person. But she happened to be from, I think, from Mississippi or Alabama, so she had a Southern accent which I thought was charming. She was a very pretty girl, but she was big, okay? She was, low, you know, big, big frame, big bone. And, you know, I, I was in meetings where he just ripped her apart for, you know, she's from the South, so she's stupid, she's fat, you know, it's just like oh. unbelievable kinds of, kind of stuff. And, you know, you, you feel really awkward sitting there while this is happening, because, you know, your instinct is to stand up and say, hey, dude, shut up. You know, but if you did that, you, your life would be just, you know, because at that point, you're still believing that this is the guy who's going to get us there. Scientology is going to prevail. And what we are trying to do is really a good thing. So, you know, the, it's, it's kind of the way in which you don't see what's happening in front of you. Did anybody ever fight back when he starts, you know, what, what can you do apart from just fall over? Well, I only saw this one incidents of, of, of violence and by the time when I turned the corner and arrived there and he had these three executives sitting on their haunches on the you know just blistering hot cement on a July day where it was over 100 degrees I mean and, and people were just awkwardly walking by them going to dinner um, and nobody they were they they just wanted the, the moment this intense moment to be over nobody was I've never heard of anybody fighting back. Plus, he's always surrounded by his entourage. You know, if anybody tried to fight back, I mean, it would be too. The you know, best thing to do, and this is what I think is what I would do if I was being physically assaulted by him, I would be, all of my focus would be on, I'm getting the hell out of here. How am I going to do it? Right? Because if you fight back, you're just going to make it harder to get out of there. So you're probably going to sort of do the defense mechanism where you roll over and play dead. Right? Mm. And then as soon as you can, you get out of there. So um, They say if you, if you do that playing dead, though, depending on who your adversary is, they might stamp on your head or something like that. So you've got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying literally play dead, but I'm saying in terms of not returning the aggression. You know, I mean, I think uh, who comes to mind is Jeff Hawkins, who was one of the, the first and one of the worst abused and I've never, I, I'm going to ask Jeff about this next time I talk to him, but I'm sure in the back of his mind, he was calculating how that he was going to just get the hell out of there. 
he wasn't thinking, you know, how am I going to punch this guy back? Plus, stuff that goes so many of the Sea Org, so many, uh, so many of the Sea Org members, the people that I worked with, like Jeff, these are really nice people. These are genuinely idealistic people. I mean, don't forget that one of the things that Scientology does to capture people and take advantage of them it is appeals to their idealism. So you're naturally going to get a lot of idealistic people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got people start ask put some questions in if you want to get some questions in because we'll, we'll go for another ten minutes or so. Uh, Sugar Puff is asking: Is Scientology used these days to create Charles Mansons? And I think that might be in reference to something John Atack said on this show recently, which was that Charles Manson actually studied uh, Scientology and did more hours, I think, than John did over a period of years, and he thinks that that kind of intensity is what led. Uh, to in some ways he's not he says he doesn't blame Scientology exactly but that can lead to that kind of intensity sometimes what do you think I don't yeah I don't I don't agree that's a whole show if you want to do it I don't agree I think that's fringe thinking I don't know John I respect him I think that's mm. that's that's from the fringes of, of you know conspiracy theory type stuff I mean um, I know that the, you know, Scientology has done a really good job of putting their books into prisons. At least there was a whole period where they were trying to, you know, send books to prisons, and they they have ran this program called Criminon to try to help prisoners. Yeah, you know, it was one of these altruistic, narcissistic things where they could point to it at a big international event and say that they were working against crime. So you know, Charles Manson finds a Scientology book and he reads it, reads it, reads it, and all of a sudden, Scientology's you know, Charles Manson's. Uh, uh, he's a Scientologist, right? Which I don't believe this. I mean, you know, I was in LA when that happened. I was a kid. I actually walked into a room once at a party and, and I confronted Charles Manson and, I, and it was crazy. I was actually the big claim to fame. I should put it That's, on my resume. It was yeah. I didn't actually meet him. It's a really weird story. I, I, this is probably a bad time to bring that up because we're trying to wind the show no, down. No, no, no. I, I want to know. I want to know. Oh, no. I was like 19 years old. You know, I grew up in, in LA and and the Beach Boys were very much a local band. When I was at 15, we used to go down to a club and watch them. They were the house band, right, at this club called Pandora's Box. They played every Sunday night, and you could get in there because they didn't serve drinks. So, you know, I mean, I used to, like, I remember being in the in the restroom downstairs taking a pee next to Dennis Wilson and, like, talking about surfing because he was the only one that surfed, right? And so for some weird reason, uh, he lived out uh, Dennis who was the one who opened the doors to the kingdom for Manson and let him in, right, to, to have access to the celebrities that he eventually murdered. It was all Dennis Wilson's fault. Uh, he lived down on Pacific Palisades uh, near Brentwood in this really wonderful compound. And for some reason, uh, a friend of my brother's was in, got a, an, an invite to a party at Dennis Wilson's house, right? And this is a really typical thing, you know, people have parties back then and everybody would go, and, you know, sometimes a band like the Yardbirds would be in town and they'd play at somebody's house and we'd all go watch. It was a very open, much freer, less structured society than it is today with regards to, you know, I think because of social media, you know, you, you have a very strong caste system, you have, you know, influencers and people who are fans and all the crazy stuff. So anyway, I ended up at this party and on the way to the party, this guy says, Oh, there's some weird dude living at Dennis's house, and he's he, he showed up there in a bus with a bunch of girls, right? And um, so then me and a friend were bopping around this house because we're like, "Whoa, we're at Dennis Wilson's house. This is like, you know, this guy's a rock star. Let's check his pad out." Turns out he was out of town, and and Charlie and the girls were just throwing a party because you know they they cost he he let one of the girls live there and then charlie moved in and then they did about two hundred thousand dollars worth of damage and then we, dennis came home and kicked them all out so this was while uh, charlie was living there so me and my friend are bopping around the house we walk into a bedroom and there's and i straight on look at this dude and he's got like steely shark eyes literally andrew i kid no you not i had cat my all i had bumps like the hairs in the back of my neck stood up and this guy was so scary and creepy and he looked at me and they all you ever walk into a room and you're like not supposed to be there everybody stops talking and they look at yes. you that's what happened and i look and there's like there, tex watson was sitting on a bureau to my right 
and there was if I sh if I saw pictures of them, I could tell you which ones they were. So, but I didn't know it was Charlie Manson. I had no idea who this person was. He was just a hippie, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so the murders happened a month later. This was like in July, and the murders happened like August. I mean, this was literally it was within a few months that they and and so it was close enough to our memory that we were all like, oh my god, that was Charlie Manson. We walked in that room that night. So. That was pretty crazy. Anyway, that's just one of the nutty things that happened to me that's not in my book. Um, but anyway, I, I don't believe all that. I just don't believe all that stuff. There's all these conspiracy theories about, you know, Charlie Manson was a Scientologist. He was programmed by Scientology in cahoots with the CIA. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Elvis is back with an alien baby. I don't know. To me, it's all that's all that ilk of stuff. It's just. It's crazy. So, uh, no, I don't Thanks. think Scientology is being used to, uh, to, to cause, you know, to, to, to make Ch Charlie Manson's. I think there's too many idealistic people that get into it. But I know people are going to argue with me. And at the end of the day, I could be wrong. You know, maybe there was a whole uh, plot to program Charlie Manson with Scientology. And it was done by the, FBI, uh, by the CIA so that they could then say that Scientology is dangerous. Who knows? Oh, no, you know, I have no idea. It goes but deep, I would like it? to. I would like to meet John someday. John, if you're watching, I would love to discuss this with you because I think he's a fascinating guy. Um, he obviously left Scientology a long, 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 long time ago, um, and I think a lot has happened since then. And I, I left. You know, yeah. I mean, there's only me and Rachel Hastings. We're the only ones speaking out who worked at, at Scientology Media Productions. I mean, you know, everybody else is pretty much part of some sort of ancient Scientology civilization. Hmm. Well, so, I, you know, I, I, I'll have to put you in touch with John then afterwards, if you want. That yeah, do. Yeah. Or just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll send him a message. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I was very much. I, 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 I have a lot of respect for him, but I don't agree with everything that he says. Hmm. Um, there's a quick thing for me from Sam Spooky Witch Hartley, who says, question off topic, Andrew, will your book be on Audible and will you narrate? If so, please say yes. I don't know if it's going to be on Audible. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a book about secrets called Take It to the Grave. It's out with Pan Macmillan Publishers in April, April the 11th, I think. Uh, and I will make a big fuss about it in a couple of months time. Uh, and it's going to be very exciting. I will be recording audio, I believe. I haven't done it yet. But I don't know if it'll be on Audible. There will be an audio version of it. I just don't know if it's going to be on that on that actual platform of Audible. But you'll be able to buy or get hold of the audio version. So I hope people will enjoy that. And then um, oh, I've lost the comments window in here. Yeah, uh, well, you have a great voice, Andrew. And I will listen to it just to hear you talk. Oh, get out of here. Yeah. Thank you. That's very no, nice seriously. I mean, you because, you know, I worked with voiceover talent for decades and you definitely you, you have a good voice. I would have hired you to do Scientology films to narrate. Where, where were you? Because we love minimum wage. We love British years. Voice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't find any kind of job for love nor money. And now I've got my YouTube channel. People could, would hire me. Yeah, well, that's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You just didn't know how to promote yourself. But no, we love a British, we had always were hiring British voiceover talent, and uh, and and especially your age because you want you know Scientology. Part of the whole propaganda is to give it a youthful, make it look cool, you know, youthful. Yeah. Anyway, I'm cool. Yeah, good luck them the, a cool, Yeah, you're a cool you're cool. Look. You're youthful, man. You're right in there. <laughs> um, I got a question here from Serana. Is David Miscavige appearing a gentleman with the good-looking young ladies? I am curious. I think what the question might mean is, is, is he a, a philanderer of sorts? Uh, is no, he off with a, women and a, things? That's the weirdest thing is the Scientology. It's so sex negative as yeah. a cult. It's like really weird. It's like you look back uh, on the Apollo days back when Hubbard was running his little flotilla of ships and he had... He had these messengers, you know, these teen and tween girls. I think you know one of them, Janice Grady, who's a wonderful uh, person I've known forever. Her mother was the founder of Celebrity Center. Janice has a, mm. uh, a, a channel with Mark Fisher, Our Scientology Stories. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, these girls, he's like, you know, Shelley Miscavige was one of them. Uh, Annie, Annie Broker, who later became Annie Broker, was one of them. And they wore like little hot, white hot pants and they wore little white like go-go boots. And they were, they wore these uniforms that were highly sexualized. And yet there's not one 
even Janice, I mean, she was right in there with Hubbard, fiercely loyal. With She was with him and the other girls every day. N never, nobody, even the, the biggest Hubbard haters have, have said no. There was never one case of any kind of sexual philandering uh, with mm. any of these girls. And you look at it, the, the optics on it are like, oh, this guy's got a harem of teenage girls. Uh, yeah. So it's really weird. It's so sex negative. Miss Gavage was obsessed with with exposing. You know, if you if you pleasured yourself in the shower, you'd be put in front of the entire group the next day and ridiculed. I mean, this is an, it's an unbelievably puritanical, uh, puritanical anti-family, anti-childbirth. It's, it's it was always insane to me how sex negative they were. Even though Hubbard put out a policy for public Scientologists that said none of our business. You know, on the surface it was whatever you want to do is none of our business as long as nobody's being upset by it because then we have to handle the upset. But that on the surface that's a policy, but boy beneath that man it is just they are brutally sex negative. Makes that's no sense because all these cults. You know, yeah. it was like Keith Ranieri and all these people. It's all about, you know, the, the, the cult leader getting all the women. But, but, but you know, you know how, we, how long how long did Nixium last compared to Scientology? And I wonder well, if that is a way you, yeah, you let yourself, yeah, get, you know, you're yeah. not controlled. Yeah, well, Hubbard was really smart. He he understood the, the public relations view and that sex can be very del deleterious towards that. In other words, if, if you're if, if people are, you know, there's a. The, there's a very famous story on the flagship Apollo. There was like a New Year's Eve, there was like an orgy, and that apparently that went on a few times. And then pro Scientology historians will say, no, 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 that's not true. Look, here's a policy. Read this policy. This policy very clearly says what the rules are about sex on the ship. Well, he wrote that policy because sex on the ship was out of control, or he would never have had a need to write it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. It, it's pretty silly, but <coughs> that was just the the kids on the ship. You know, it was the seventies, right? It's like there was that was before STDs could kill you. They were just inconvenient. You know, that was like yeah. free love days. You know, sex was just a way that you showed friendships. So that's changed a lot. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I think I answered your question. So no, he, yeah. he, yeah, he doesn't. He, he, no, he's, he's nobody's good enough for him. I mean, he's not, he's not like that at all. I understand. He's got this, his girlfriend, his, his assistant, and she's good enough for him. Yeah. No, but, but nobody really is good enough for him. Uh, Mitch. Yeah. But I you, just, can I, I just want to say one thing that we have, there's been a lot of conjecture if he himself isn't s somehow sexually inadequate, uh, which hmm. is why he's so angry because we see so little, evidence of his sexuality so um, okay sorry Andrew. yeah I, th I no no not at all i think that's a really important point to make as well and it's it's something that i think a lot of people are wondering about but yeah i was going to say people should go and check out your channel it is just below people can click it in the link of the description um and it's it's it's, it's brilliant you know and you, there's there are very few people who know as much particularly about the recent days because you only left just over a year ago about Scientology so I hope people will go over there just click over and go and watch Mitch's videos go over as well in the description is my new channel as well called Heretics so click on that on both of our channels you want to do that thing when you've got the alarm and you'll know when videos are coming out uh, my I'm going to put out three of the first uh, episodes in the next few days so if you click that alarm button you'll be sure to see and, uh, and be there right at the beginning for the premieres and stuff so it's going to be very exciting mitch thank you so much for being on uh thank you andrew it's always a pleasure to see you it, truly I, I love coming on your channel <laughs>